Our sins have been forgiven. And so we will begin this morning's worship service with a time of confession. I will be reading from Matthew's gospel account when Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane. The word of the Lord says, And Jesus said to his disciples, 
My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let's take a few moments, church, to reflect the many ways that our flesh was weak and confess them to our crucified and risen Savior. As we have confessed our sins to the Lord, church, receive this assurance of grace. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave us his spirit. Are you excited to worship the Lord this morning, church? Amen? You don't sound like it, guys. If you're excited to worship the Lord this morning, let's give the Lord a big clap of praise. I mean, Good Friday is done. It's resurrection. You can clap louder than that, church. Can I request everyone to please stand as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord? Luke 24, verse 1 to 6 says here, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their face to the ground, the man said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but He has risen. Amen? Oh, give the Lord a louder praise, church. Now, guys, before we go to sing our songs, allow me to share what Edmund Chan have shared to us during the IDMC. It's a story about a kid playing with the hustler. You know, they were playing a chess game, okay? Now, when the hustler was about to beat the little boy, there was a grandmaster you know, who passed by the, their game, and he saw the chest, the grandmaster whispered something to the little boy. Now, while everything was seemed lost, no, while everything was, was like the hustler was winning against the little boy, the little boy moved his king and eventually won the game. Now, after that, people were asking the grandmaster, what did you teach the little boy? How did he overcome such an impossible feat? Now, this is what the grandmaster said. As I've studied the game, I found out that the king has one more move. And church, that one move of the king totally changed the game. Now friends, while the kingdom of darkness thought that they were winning, 
while everything seemed lost for the salvation and redemption of humanity. Our King, King Jesus, has one more move because on that resurrection Sunday, His lifeless body began to breathe. Oh, He is risen and He's alive forevermore. If you believe that, church, give the Lord a big clap of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus, we worship you, O oh God, for you alone deserve all worship, Lord. You are risen and you're alive forevermore. And we just want to give you our praise, O oh God. So, Father, as we gather this morning, may we receive the praise of your people. This is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen and amen. Let's make a joyful noise for our King Church. Hallelujah. Come on, let's make a joyful noise. Guys, it's Resurrection Sunday. Oh, you can clap louder than that, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's make a joyful noise. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Let's sing to our risen King Church. Who shakes the whole?
just give the Lord a loud clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We exalt your holy name, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's continue to make a joyful noise, church. We just want to thank you for the cross, oh God. Indeed, Lord, it is finished. That the last time, Lord, it is finished, it is done. We are forever yours and you are forever ours, oh God. Well, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your nail-pierced hands. Thank you for the crown of thorn, Lord. Thank you for giving your life to us, oh God. And we also want to thank you today, Lord Jesus, for the empty tomb, Lord. You're risen, O oh God. You're alive and you're alive forevermore. King of glory, King of kings, and Lord of lords, Prince of peace, oh, we worship you, O oh God. Oh, we bless your holy name, King Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. 
but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet, the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. What a blessed Savior we have. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
can feel and experience and hope in the freedom that you have won for us. And all the glory be to your name. How amazing it is, Lord, that every soul in this room sings of one name, sings to one name, and that's Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And Lord, we pray that as individuals and as a church, we will be a people all about Jesus. From the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we retire at night, and every breath in between, by your Spirit, makes a people about Jesus, a people who as we gather here week in, week out, a people who will never grow tired, who will never be able to exhaust the glories of Calvary, the glories and the triumphs of our Savior King. And we pray, Father, that this glory that we have encountered, this glory that we know, this glory that lives in our hearts, this glory give us the courage, the openings to testify to those around us, that those in darkness might also know the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Lord, do everything it takes to make each of us more of Jesus, more about Jesus in our lives. And Lord, we know, we declare that we can never exhaust, we can never go deep enough to know all the fullness of Jesus. Yet every day is a sweeter day because it's a day of knowing Jesus more and more. So Lord, we are all about you, all about you, all about you, Lord. Amen.
Father, indeed, O God, help us, Lord, to always turn our eyes upon Jesus, O Lord, to just gaze upon his beauty and majesty, O God. All the days of our life, Lord, empower us to walk the narrow road that leads to life, our, fix, our eyes fixed on the crown of life, our eyes fixed on Jesus alone, Lord. So we thank you, Father. We bless your holy name, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, we worship and pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now, church, it's Resurrection Sunday. Before you take your seats, just go around the place and greet at least five people. Happy Resurrection Sunday, okay? If you don't reach five people, you're not allowed to sit down. At least five, guys. delighted to see newcomers here today. We would like to get to know you better, so on your way out, please drop by the Welcome Center. We have a special gift for you. We are now starting a new season in our church. So starting May 4 and 5, the service schedule will be as follows. Saturday, English service at 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Sunday, English service at 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Sunday, English service at 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Sunday Sabawano service at 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. VBS 2024 is going to be on June 19 to 21, Wednesday to Friday. The theme will be The Amazing Wonders Aviation, Psalm 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Registration. Early bird at 700 pesos from March 23 to April 14. Regular rate at 1,000 from April 15 to May 26. Late registration at 1,200 from May 27 to June 2. We would like to call for volunteers in the following areas. Praise and worship, skit, games, decoration, creative media, crafts, documentation, and security. Couples Retreat 2024. We will be having it on June 11 and 12 at Costa Bella, Mactan. Registration, 2,000 subsidy for the first 20 registrants, 9,000 per couple. March 30 to April 28, early bird, 11,000 per couple. March 26 to 28, regular rate, 13,000 per couple. All registration is inclusive of accommodation and meals. We would like to invite everyone to join us for the quarterly church plenary happening this April 17, Wednesday, 7 p.m. In the light of everything that's happening in our midst, the call for corporate prayer is more urgent than ever. Please join us. We hope to see you there. Morning, church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. You don't seem happy. Happy Resurrection Sunday again. Let's do that once more. All right. Praise God. Uh, before we uh, proceed with some more announcements, uh, we will be giving a certificate of appreciation for the disciples of Discovery Group 11. And we will also be giving, giving a certificate of completion for their members who completed all sessions. So this certificate of appreciation is given to Joseph Ray Duhenio on this 31st day of March for faithfully discipling his Discovery Group members from January 12, 2024 to March 10, 2024. Congratulations, AI. And his co-discipler, Richard Oliver Ke. I'll be calling their members, Nathan Scott Urhel. All right. Congratulations, Nathan. Uh, they will be receiving a, a study Bible as well. Chris Luis Marcojos.
Congratulations, Stu. Ezekiel Villa Esther. That's where. Carl Claro. Wilmer Paulo Lopez. Congratulations, Stu. All right, so uh, we'll just take one quick group picture. Join us, Nige. All right. All right. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Just some additional announcements. Uh, we're opening a new life group. In the south, uh, this life group will start on April 4. Uh, they will meet every Thursday at 5 p.m. The location will be at MCA Clinic Mambaling near Shopwise. For more information, uh, please approach Brother Alan or me after the service. Next, uh, Business as Mission Conference. Uh, I want us to support this because our very own Pastor Jojo Chua uh, is one of the speakers. Uh, this will be on May 25, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Seda Ayala Center. Registration fee is 1,500 pesos. It will be a full day of Christ-centered messages from Christian businessmen. They will also be sharing their testimonies, and there is, there's going to be a Q&A portion. So secure your slots by scanning the QR code found in our welcome area. We're about to conclude chapter 4 of John, and I have entitled this morning's sermon, Growing in Faith. One of the courses that I really enjoyed in seminary was a course on the life and works of C.S. Lewis. We were asked to read several of his books, including the Chronicles of Narnia, and we were asked to give a book report on each uh, book that C.S. Lewis wrote. Now, I must confess, I don't enjoy uh, giving book reports, but the book report on the Chronicles of Narnia was a delightful experience. I enjoyed that one. Now, one of the things that really made an impact on me was C.S. Lewis's perspective on pain. You see, Lewis had tasted pain in many ways that few can relate to. He lost his mother at an early age, saw his dad emotionally abandon him, suffered from a respiratory illness as a teenager, fought and was wounded in World War I, and finally had to bury his beloved wife. Through all this, Lewis wrote about all of his heartache in his work entitled, The Problem of Pain. In this work, Lewis penned one of his most famous lines, pain insists upon being attended to. Can we show the slide, please? Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You see, C.S. Lewis became keenly aware of God's character and ways in his suffering. And I learned that it is when our self-sufficiency is peeled away that we see how weak we really are. It is in that moment of weakness that, as God tells Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my power is made perfect in weakness. Beloved, it is in our pain that God allows us to experience His power most intimately. Can you think of situations in your life where God used pain to bring you closer to Him? I'm sure we can think of some, right? For Christians who have experienced pain in life, you can attest to this truth that God shouts to us through our pain. 
and reminds us that we desperately need Him every single day of our lives. Hence, in the Christian life, we have learned that God often uses pain and suffering to get us to seek Him in ways that we never would have done if the crisis had not occurred. And the good news is the Lord graciously meets us at our point of crisis. But I want you to know that that's just the beginning. He wants us to believe in and follow Him not only because He can deliver us from our crisis, but also because He is the only one who can save us and satisfy us. And He wants us to know that He is worthy of our trust because of who He is. You see, this is the truth that Jesus wants the royal official to believe in our text. Now, what I would like for you to notice as we go through this section is the way Jesus skillfully drew this man into a deeper level of faith. In our text today, Jesus accomplishes this miracle in a way that enhances the official's faith from believing that Jesus could heal his son to believing that Jesus could save. So in reverence for God's word, let us now stand and read our text in John chapter 4, 43 to 54. The word of God says, After the two days he left for Galilee, now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you believe, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. What he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of your son. Because he lives and lives forevermore, we know that our salvation is secure in him and that our faith in him is not in vain. And Father, as we study your word and see this sign that your son performed, help us see that you are the God who is interested about our growth in the Christian life. You want us to grow in faith as we encounter trials of various kinds. So Lord, show us the way. Show us the way to grow through this text. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For the context of John chapter 4, uh, we have seen our Lord interact with the women of Samaria. In that encounter, we saw how Jesus revealed himself as the living water, as the Messiah. And something really amazing happened in that encounter because as this Samaritan woman believed who Jesus was, she left her jar of water and immediately went to her town and told everyone, about Jesus. The Samaritans went to see Jesus and they too believed in Jesus as 
the Messiah. Now Jesus is on his way from Samaria into Galilee, and we read in verse 43. After the two days he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. The parenthetical comment in verse 44 has given some scholars and commentators problems. And the problem is really simple. Jesus says, prophets have no honor in their own country. However, if Galilee is his own country, it is a peculiar statement because John tells us that the Galileans welcomed Jesus. And we have nothing in John like Luke's story of the rejection at Nazareth, which is, by the way, part of Lower Galilee. Now, in order for us to solve this, we need to remember that Jesus had just enjoyed a successful ministry in Samaria. We learned from last week's sermon that many Samaritans believed in the Lord Jesus as the Messiah, even though they did not witness a miracle. The Galileans in the present story, however, welcome him not because they think Jesus is the Messiah, but because they have witnessed his activity in Jerusalem, which likely refers to his cleansing of the temple. They knew about the corruption that was taking place in the temple, and they did not want that. And they saw Jesus as someone who stood up for what is right. Their interest in Jesus, therefore, refers to his role in opposition to the temple authorities. Moreover, Galilee's reception was based on miracles. They had recently witnessed Jesus perform in Jerusalem. Now, this was not the kind of faith that Jesus priced. See that in John chapter 2, 23 to 25. He knew that they were unbelievers who were simply fascinated by signs and miracles. And so, yes, he is initially welcomed as a miracle worker, but he is not honored as the Messiah. This background brings us to the story in chapter 4, 46 to 54, which illustrates the point of verse 43 to 45. This royal official comes to Jesus with Galilean faith. He's not coming to Jesus because he is seeking for forgiveness or salvation He is coming to Jesus because of a personal crisis. His son is sick and is about to die. Now, as we study our text, I want you to notice the stages of his faith and how he eventually believed in Jesus as the Messiah. Let's read verse 46. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. The Greek word for royal official is the word basilikos, sometimes rendered as nobleman. This title refers to some official attached to the service of a king. And so he provided government service for Herod Antipas, who was not really a king, though he did belong to the royal house of Herod the Great and was sometimes referred to as a king. You find that in Mark 6, 14. Being a government official, this royal official was a man of wealth. He was prosperous. He had status. He obviously had the means to bring in the best physicians to treat his son's serious illness. And he probably had sought all of the physicians in Capernaum, but they had not been able to help. And he had grown desperate. This official probably heard about the signs and miracles that Jesus performed. Maybe he knew about the miracle that Jesus performed at Cana, where he turned water into wine. 
And so because he's desperate and he hears about that this miracle worker is in the vicinity, he travels 20 miles from Capernaum to Cana just to give this request. John tells us he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Now the verb tense that John uses in the original Greek indicates that he was repeatedly imploring. He was repeatedly begging Jesus to come down and heal his son. Now, I'm sure every time Jesus went to a town, there was a large crowd gathered around him. And they too wanted Jesus to heal their sick loved ones. But this guy stood out because he was persistent. He didn't just make this request once, Jesus, could you come and heal my son? He repeatedly, continuously begged Jesus to come. There's a sense of urgency and desperation that we see in this man. Every parent who has had a very sick child knows the anxiety that this father is feeling right now. By the way, the phrase tells us that this is not merely one of the man's sons. In fact, the father in our story uses a Greek term of endearment to describe his son in verse 49. The Greek word for child in verse 49 implies a younger child, perhaps seven years old or younger. This is a child, a little boy whose illness has torn his father's heart. So he went to see Jesus and begged Jesus to go home with him. Now it is clear from his response that he knew that Jesus had the ability to heal his son. He had faith. But as what we will see, his faith, as what theologians would say, is called partial faith. He believed that Jesus is a great miracle worker who can heal his son, but he did not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus knew that. And so as he heard this urgent request from the Father, Jesus does not give an answer that directly addressed the request. Now you would think if Jesus really cared about this Father, he would say, okay, let's hurry up. Let's go, show me the way. Let's go immediately. I want to see your son so I could heal him. You would expect Jesus to say those words. But Jesus recognized that the man came to him out of an earthly need, one that had nothing to do with a desire for salvation. And you see, the goal of Jesus here is not simply to perform this sign and heal his son. The ultimate concern or the ultimate goal of Jesus is this. He wants this royal official to move from partial faith to saving faith. And he is going to help this man reach that point of salvation. So he responded, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Jesus' rebuke was not only directed at the man, but also at the Galileans who were there. How do we know that? Well, in the original Greek, the word you is in plural. So it's not just referring to this royal official, but also to the other Galileans who were gathered around him. If Jesus used modern language, he'd probably say, y'all, um, y'all people, uh, y'all, right? <laughs> Unless y'all see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. These Galileans don't really believe in him as the Messiah. They simply are just waiting for Jesus to perform another sign because perhaps some of them would just want to be entertained. Now, while Jesus used this opportunity to confront the Galileans of their unbelief, he also saw this as an opportunity to help the man see his greatest need. Yes, he has a personal crisis. He has a need. His son is sick and is at the point of death. He desperately comes to Jesus, 
asking Jesus to come with him so that he could heal his son. He has a personal need, but God uses this personal need to show him his greatest need. Now for some of us, maybe that's, that, that was one of the ways that God drew us to himself. Before your conversion, you had a personal crisis. You were going through a tough time. And you hear about Jesus. Maybe a Christian friend told you that Jesus is full of grace and truth. He is full of compassion. So you took your chances. Maybe you attended a Bible study or attended a worship service like this. You had a personal need. And you were desperate and you were asking God to meet your need. But in the process of asking God to meet your need, you discover your greatest need, which is salvation. And you come to faith and are saved. Jesus wants him to know there is a greater need here than the healing of his son. And so after receiving that rebuke, we ask, how will this father respond? Will he respond in frustration? I traveled 20 miles just to hear this from you, Jesus, seriously? I've been repeatedly begging you to come. I believe this was a test of faith. After he received this rebuke, this man remains persistent. He does not leave in frustration, but says, Sir, come down before my child dies. He has made this trip and he was unwilling to go back home without Jesus coming with him. He ignores the rebuke and once again begs Jesus to come with him. It is as if he was saying, I don't want to get involved in discussions about theology. Jesus, please come. My son is dying. That's all I ask. Please. His faith is seen in his persistence. However, we see something wrong in the way he expressed his faith. You see, the officer operated on at least two assumptions. First, that Jesus had to be present to effect a healing on his son. So Jesus must accompany the official to his home in Capernaum where the sick boy lay. Secondly, that Jesus was powerless to effect any kind of cure or relief beyond death. And this shows you the weakness of his faith. He thinks that our Lord can only heal if he comes down to Capernaum. It never occurred to him that Jesus could heal his sons, his son from a distance of 20 miles. That Jesus could just simply speak the words while at Cana, and his son who is at Capernaum would be immediately healed. He never thought that would be possible. And further, he seems to think that if the child dies, then there is nothing that the Lord Jesus can do about it. Apparently, he does not know that Jesus has the ability to raise dead people back to life. Now, Jesus could have gone with the man and healed the boy in his presence. He did that in, in several occasions. He did this with Jairus' daughter when he raised her from the dead. That would have been more dramatic, but it would not have developed this man's faith. Remember the goal. Jesus wants to develop his faith, to grow his faith, to the degree that he trusts in Jesus as the Messiah. So instead, Jesus puts the man in a curious dilemma here. The man said, come. By the way, when you read the original Greek, he is commanding Jesus. Sir, come immediately. And he's a royal official. Maybe he's used to having servants obey his orders. But Jesus is not going to take orders from a royal official. So how, what does he do? How does he respond? He gives a command. And here we see the authority of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. It's one word. 
go. Go. Jesus replied, and he gives a promise, your son will live. Now let's hit the pause button right here. This man traveled a distance of 20 miles. He's now at Cana. He wants Jesus to come with him so that Jesus could heal his son. He begs Jesus repeatedly. And then Jesus simply tells him, go, your son will live. If you were the father, how would you respond to that? Would you be like, that's great, Lord, but we we need to go now. All right, Uh, can you come with me now? Because my son is dying. What was running through his mind at this point? Before this, he never imagined Jesus healing his son from a distance. He never even explored that as an option. How would he respond to this command to go and this promise that his son will live? So let's press the play button. John says, The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Do you see how his faith is growing here? First, he believes that Jesus can heal his son if he goes with him to Capernaum. Now Jesus says, I'm not going to do that. You go. Your son will live. At this point, he now believes that Jesus can heal his son from a distance. Do you see the progression there? This royal official believes Christ's word that his son was healed immediately. And he demonstrates this faith by what? By heading home. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. He did not grab Jesus by the hand and drag him to Capernaum, rather he grew calm. He stopped pleading. Remember before this, he repeatedly begged Jesus. All of a sudden, after this command and after this promise, his heart is now rested. He believes the word of Christ. His trust was well placed. What can we learn here? I think often we have a preconceived idea of how the Lord must work to solve our crisis. This man had a preconceived idea of how Jesus could heal his son. You need to go with me to Capernaum so you could heal him. But a lot of times, our preconceived ideas or solutions are not the solutions that are really best for us. And it's not what would give God greater glory. So when we pray to God and plead to the Lord, and He says no, and decides to solve your personal crisis His way, you need to trust His heart. Because He knows what is best for you. And what is best for you? It's not just healing. It's not just deliverance. It's not just your problem being solved. What is best for you? What does Jesus want to come out of as you endure trials and tribulations? What does He want to come out of your life? Faith. He wants to grow and develop your faith in Him. This noble man in the midst of his desperation heard the promise of Christ and believed it. He didn't say, okay, well, I guess I have to go back home to see if that is true. He didn't have a cell phone. He couldn't call his servants. Kamusta na si Dodong diha? Naayo na? He didn't have Facebook. He didn't have Viber or WhatsApp. He had to simply believe. And as I meditated on his response, I came to this conclusion. Every step that he took as he headed home were literally steps of faith. Every step that he took was a declaration. I believe your words, Jesus. I believe your promise. I believe that when I step into my home, my son will be well and alive. Do you believe that requires faith? 
That requires faith. At this point, he has not witnessed a miracle yet. But he had to trust the words of Christ. And what does this tell us? When we go through a trial, even when we don't see God solving our problems, we can trust His Word. Amen? We can trust His promises. He believed that Jesus healed his boy at a distance instead of traveling to Capernaum. And by the way, believing in Jesus' Word is a mark of genuine faith in John. I want you to see a parallel here. The Samaritan woman at the well believed the words of Christ. Jesus did not perform a miracle. She did not witness a miracle. The Samaritans did not witness a miracle. Jesus stayed with them and and discipled them for two days. And they believed. This royal official has not yet witnessed his son being well and alive. But he chose to believe the words of Christ. So Jesus very skillfully drew this man into a deeper level of faith. Faith in Christ's promise and word. Verse 51 says, While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. On hearing the good news that his son lives, the royal official believes it and goes down to Capernaum. The man did not see immediately that his son was living, but he gave full credence to the words of Christ. This was the kind of faith that Jesus was always seeking. Acceptance of his word or testimony without hesitation. Without even seeing a miracle, he believed and thus he became a model of faith. I know people in the world say to see is to believe. I haven't seen Jesus with my own eyes. You claim that your Savior rose from the dead after three days. Well, I haven't witnessed that. We have no video recording of Jesus being raised to new life. So I refuse to believe. We need to understand our our faith is based on objective truth. Historical records prove that Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, Josephus, a Jewish historian, was not a follower of Christ, still chose to record the resurrection of our Lord. It was something that he could not deny. And for him to be a, a good historian, he had to include that in his writings. But more than the evidence that we see from from historical records, we have the Word of God. Amen? And the Word of God tells us, the Gospel of John tells us, Jesus is the Son of God. The Gospel of John tells us that Jesus is the Messiah. The question is, will you believe the Word of God? Will you respond in faith? I pray that we would follow the example of this royal official. You see, in verse 52, when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. So here we find the coherence of time convinced the official of the supernatural power of Jesus' word and also the fact that God was in Jesus. Notice what it says in verse 53. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This father enjoyed the tremendous benefit of seeing his son healed by Jesus. But in that act of mercy and compassion, he received the greatest gift. And what is that? The gift of faith, the gift of salvation. This man came to understand who Jesus was and he believed in him as the Messiah. 
He came to possess saving faith. And here we see the wisdom of Jesus here. He accomplishes this miracle in a way that enhances the faith of the royal official. From partial faith, he now has saving faith. When the father realized this truth, he gave testimony to those in his household and they too believed. When we think of the word household, we usually just think of the parents and the children, right? But during the ancient times, this, this also included the servants. The servants in that household. And since this guy was a man of wealth, I would assume that he had many servants. And so a revival took place in his household. His wife and children, together with his many servants, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, they serve as an illustration of John's purpose for writing this gospel. These signs have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. It's simply believing in the Lord Jesus, not working for your salvation, not trying to merit His love through good works. But the Bible simply tells us, just believe and you will be saved. Believe in who Jesus is and what He has done to save us and you will be saved. So what do we have here in chapter 4? You had a Samaritan village saved in this chapter and now you have a household saved saved. Since he worked for Herod Antipas, we can say that salvation comes to the house of a Herodian. This is significant because both the Herodians and the Samaritans were greatly despised by the Jews. I just love how John structures his gospel. In John 3.16, he tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then you hit John chapter 4. These half-breeds, these Samaritans, these, these people that was greatly despised by the Jews experience love and mercy from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews hated the Herodians as well. But this Herodian household experienced salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves the world. He loves Jews and Gentiles, Samaritans, Herodians. Again, this reminds us of verse 42, right? We saw this last week. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. He is not just the Savior of different races, but He is also the Savior of different ranks. He saved some fishermen in chapter 1. He saved an immoral woman in chapter 4. Eventually, he saved a high-level Pharisee named Nicodemus. And here he saves the household of some Herodians. This again reminds us that the gospel is to the world. Whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. And lastly, in verse 54, it says, This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. The second sign refers, of course, to the two signs in Cana, not to the overall miracles of the Lord that the Lord performed since Jesus had done other signs as indicated in chapter 2, verse 23. But a more important detail that I want you to notice carefully here is the word that is used for the miracle. It is the word sign. A sign is a signifier that points to a spiritual reality. In this particular case, in John's context, these signs that Jesus performed show people specific truths concerning himself. So he's not just in the business of performing miracles for the sake of performing miracles. 
Every sign that he chose was intentional and it had a specific purpose. He wanted to reveal a specific truth truth about himself. And so here in John chapter 4, what does this sign teach us? Why is it unnecessary for Jesus to travel to Capernaum to heal this young boy? Well, this sign teaches us that Jesus is not confined to a place. His capacity, His knowledge, His power go beyond human imagination and ability. And again, this sign proves that He is the Son of God. Amen? His ability to heal from a distance of 20 miles proves that He is the Son of God. And such self-disclosure by God should lead men and women to faith so that they see the dramatic penetration of God in the world and praise and worship Him. You see, the goal of these signs, beloved, is to lead us to worship God. That's the goal. God delivers us from our personal crisis. God saves us by His grace so that we get to worship Him for who He is and for what He has done. See, our faith should grow as we come to know our Lord and His Word better as we see that this one, this Messiah, in whom we have placed our trust, is even greater than we imagined. If you have not believed in Christ, it's pretty hard for you to deny Jesus was a miracle worker. Really impossible. Really contrary to history. In fact, our, our tour guide in, when we went to Israel, who was not a believer, affirmed that Jesus did perform miracles in the first century. If you have not believed in Christ, it's hard to deny those signs that He performed. It's impossible to deny that His words were divine. No one ever heard anyone speak like He spoke. Now you can call Him the greatest miracle worker or the greatest teacher who ever lived, but I want you to know that is not enough. You need to believe and affirm that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Messiah and that He is the Son of God. And how do we really know that He is the only one who can save us? How do we really know that Jesus is God? We know that because of Easter. We know that because of Resurrection Sunday. We know that because of what we are celebrating this morning. He did not remain in that grave. On the third day, He rose again to new life, to prove that He is the way, the truth, and the life. You can trust Jesus for who He really is because He lives. He lives forevermore. We serve the King of kings and Lord of lords who is alive forevermore and is seated at the right hand of the Father and is one day coming back to establish God's kingdom on earth. So do you believe in Jesus? If you have not believed in Jesus, today is the day to do that. Believe and you will be saved. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, This section in John's Gospel has defined for us what saving faith is all about. It's not about simply being fascinated by the signs and miracles that your Son performed. Saving faith is trusting His person, His very words. And his death on the cross 
as the payment for our sins. Father, if there is anyone here who is like the royal official, who has a personal crisis and is desperate for deliverance, I pray that you would use that person's pain to lead him or her closer to you. And as you grow the faith of that individual, I pray that that person would transition from partial faith to saving faith. That that person would recognize that his greatest need is not physical healing, it's not financial stability. but eternal life and forgiveness that can only be found in Jesus. For we know, God, everything that we own, everything that we have in this world will be left behind when we die. We won't be able to bring a single cent with us when we die. But if we have a relationship with you, we can bring that relationship our relationship with you will never be broken. We will never be separated from you. Either death, principalities, forces of darkness, all these things cannot separate us from your love. And we know, Lord, our faith in you is not in vain. Because Jesus, you rose from the dead and you live forevermore. And we celebrate your life, your death, and resurrection this Resurrection Sunday. We thank you for proving to us through the signs that you performed, through your death and resurrection, that you truly are the Messiah, that you truly are the Son of God. And as we have received this glorious salvation, we want to respond by worshiping you for who you are and for what you have done. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for ministering to us this morning. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we all stand? Shall we all stand, please, as we sing our closing song?
May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Praise God from whom all blessings